One of the hidden benefits of making anime abandoned is that sometimes, on very rare occasions, I come across a story. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, anime, and by extension every other form of art, is just like any other human endeavor. It had to be made. No film, book, video game, and yes, anime ever came into existence by it just spontaneously willing itself into being. It's relatively easy to think that way, especially when it comes to anime, seeing as how the process of creating it isn't common knowledge, helped along by the fact that, well, Japan is far away, okay? But when people come together to create something large-scale like a film, oftentimes the behind-the-scenes story is as compelling as the film itself. For instance, I'm assuming that most of you watching this are at least aware of the documentary Hearts of Darkness, a compelling yarn about what it took to make Apocalypse Now a reality. Likewise, Burden of Dreams is a peerless look at the toll that not compromising truly takes. That, and it's also darkly humorous how Werner Herzog cannot help himself from literally reenacting the exact same story he's trying to make a movie about in Fitzcarraldo. It is as if the director is unaware of the obvious irony, which reflects the tragedy of the human condition in a cracked mirror of hubris, galvanized further by having to deal with Klaus Kinski. Und du sagst es mir nicht, aber ich schreie da, weil ich leck mich doch am Arsch. Der Moment ist überhaupt gekommen, wo ich dir in die Fresse haue. Today's story is nowhere near as harrowing as those two films, but it is the most hilarious story of ineptitude I have ever heard in film, anime or otherwise. And I am here to share it all with you in Gundress. Now, trying to find out the backstory of Gundress is a bit difficult, since most of the details have been lost to time thanks to the lack of preservation. So a lot of this is me trying to fill in the blanks left open by anemic internet articles with personal recounts and my own investigative work. So take everything I say with a grain of salt. Here it goes. Our story begins with one Nikatsu Corporation, one of the oldest movie studios in all of Japan, having been formed in 1912. But like most every other film studio in America during the late 60s and 70s, Nikatsu would suffer a major decline, having to salvage itself by making adult movies, dubbed pink films. While this tied them over throughout the 80s, the bubble economy would put an end to their second resurgence, and they would have to file for bankruptcy protection by 1993, where they got something of a bailout to the tune of $28 million by, of all companies, Namco. By 1996, or 97, depending on the source, Nikatsu would become another arm of Namco. Now, flush with Pac-Man and Tekken cash, Nikatsu decided to make a splash in the anime market. They dipped their toe in the anime production market before, with titles like Ayane's High Kick and Dark Cat. <sighs> To say that Nikatsu's choice in which anime projects to produce was rough would be an understatement, but Nikatsu would not be deterred by their past failures, not when they have the safety net of Namco. And here is where we meet our main character, Orca. Now if that name sounds familiar, it's because we did previously cover an anime that they had a hand in, Landlock. Two blue eyes and a red eye to complete the circle. So what is Orca? Well, that's a tough question to answer. As I've come to understand it, Orca is a creative team made up of a loose assortment of people, the members of which I can't really nail down because no website of theirs exists anymore. And ANN, despite being a great source of information, has little to nothing about their history. Hell, they have them listed under two different entries for Landlock and Gundress, respectively. But the thing you have to understand is that the only thing that Orca really had going for them was that they knew how to network. Somehow they had gotten into contact with Ghost in the Shell creator Shiro Masamune and had him design some characters for Landlock, which was going to be a huge multimedia franchise, complete with OVA, video game, comics, and other animated sundries. That's right, this was going to be a big deal. Damn them! Not Saul too! Ah! Ah! Saul! That is one area that contains many different kinds of beetle fossils! Surprisingly, the video game never happened, which left the producers of the OVA little option other than to hype the fact that Shiro did some design work for the OVA, even though all he really did was draw some posters and some concept art for it. You have joined and become one! <laughs> 
But sometimes losing teaches you more than winning. And Orca was learning big time. With Landlock in the rearview mirror, Orca had a bit of soul searching to do if they hoped to not repeat the same mistakes they made. Or at least they would have if Nikatsu didn't come a knockin' with a sack full of cash wanting their own multimedia franchise, also complete with comics and video games. This time for sure, Rocky! And this time... Well, it eventually cost them five million dollars. Now, I know that doesn't seem like a lot even if you try to factor in inflation, but you have to understand. Street Fighter II, the animated movie, released only three years prior to Gundress, was budgeted at six million dollars. And that was a movie about one of the highest grossing arcade games of all time, with it raking in over half a billion dollars in 1995 money from just the arcade cabinets in America alone. So to have Street Fighter II money poured into a completely new... IP, helmed by a creative team that had only produced one other anime that flamed out even before it had a chance to get going, and whose only real talent is that they have Masamune's business card? Oh dear. It looks like we have a car crash ahead of us. Oh, the humanity. Obviously, this decision to invest into a project like this could have only come from a company suffering from a toxic mixture of being relatively new to the anime business and having newfound financial security after years of proverbial drought. But it isn't fair to say that Nikatsu were completely naive in believing that Orca would eventually come through. There was a firm foundation. Unlike with Landlock, there would indeed be a manga, as well as art books and a PS1 game, so in retrospect, you could make the argument that their attempts to make a new franchise off the back of a film and a well-known artist were more successful than with Landlock. Volk? Ah, uh, yes? Do you want to sleep with me? What? Right now, if you want, you can do as you like. Low bar, I know. In any other context, Nikatsu wouldn't have been in the same building as Orca, but Nevertheless, deals were made, and over the next two years, deals would be broken. The first problem might seem obvious, but it would also prove to be the most prophetic. Orca had little idea what in the hell they were going to make a movie about. Head writer Junichi Sakai talked about the things he, as well as the rest of Orca, wanted to see in a movie, and all they managed to whittle it down to was seeing chicks and robots fight. <laughs> Now that, in of itself, does not a story make, but it does at least give a foundation for design, which they asked Masamune to contribute to. Or they just had him draw a bunch of robots from his previous manga Apple scene and asked if they could use them. Yes, their big stab into making a brand new, exciting property is to wholesale lift the robots from Appleseed, called Landmates. And Masamune just greenlights this idea, as if this doesn't defeat the purpose of this entire film at all. You know, the more I investigate this relationship between Orca and Shiro Masamune, the more I realize that it's built entirely upon convenient apathy. Considering the time of production, which would have been the mid to late 90s, Masamune was well on his way to not giving a shit about anything other than making his umpteenth porn book. Make a manga that would go on to be a worldwide success, complete with genre-defining feature film, and let's see you try to care about some group of guys you might have met at a convention once upon a time ago between counting your fat stacks of yen. I mean, if he's not on the payroll and all he's doing is recycling his own robot designs, how much emotional investment can he really have in this project? I'll tell you how much. Not enough to appear in the behind the scenes making of documentary. And the aptly named Sir not appearing in this film. 
we do get some emails from the man, which does at least shed some light on his actual contributions and role in this film, but considering how much Gundress sells itself as being from Masamune Shiro, him not even being here is kind of insulting. It'd be like if Tim Burton didn't even bother to do press junkets for Tim Burton's Nightmare Before Christmas. While Masamune did have a stronger presence in this film than he did in Landlock, that isn't to say he had much of one at all. From the loose amount of details he was given, Masamune gave Orca a team of women to be the main characters, but in his head, he believed that the story would be about the, well, leader of these women. But because Orca didn't really have a story to begin with, by the time the script had been produced, it turned out that the main character would be the woman with the dark past, Alyssa. Perhaps that's what Goman sees in you. Why he thinks you deserve a second chance. Well, okay, plans can change, but I'm sure his other characters were presented as intended. Quote. Michelle is the most convoluted character and is more dangerous than Alyssa. She wants to be seen as a classy grown woman and understandably so, ellipses. She has a greater chest and intellect than would be expected of her age. I'm sure that detail was very important to the man. The man here being the same guy behind Gal Grease. Seriously, why does Shiro Masamune insist on painting his women like they just took a palm oil bath? The intricacies of her character are complicated. If necessary, she would not hesitate to use biological or chemical weapons and has a sharp personality. She is definitely a highly explosive woman. I basically made her the cute younger sister with a volatile look in her eyes. Will this come across in the anime? Hmm, nope. I know we're in trouble, but... I don't think it's fair to say that everything that's happened is Alyssa's fault. Have you gone completely off your rocker? If I didn't know any better, I'd say you were starting to sound like a real member of Angel Arms. I guess I've been listening to Kay. What? Not me? <laughs> but hey, Gundress wouldn't be the first anime to start off with concept art without an actual story in mind. Hell, half of the episodes of Keep Your Hands Off Azoken were about the characters trying to find a story for their animation. And as long as Nikatsu was cutting the checks, everything would be peachy keen, and that includes splurging on real actors, like Rie Ishizuka, who would play Alyssa. For the record, Rie, at the time, was known more for screen acting than voice acting, and boy does she look uncomfortable and awkward with director Katsuyoshi Yatabe. <laughs> Fun little fact, after Gundress, Rie would be cast in more anime roles, including Azuken, as well as Mezzo Forte and Angel Blade. I shit you not. So yeah, on top of the story that they are literally making up on the fly, tied together only by the art of Masamune and some notes that they heartily ignore, they were bolstered by some top tier talent that looked like they would rather be anywhere else. But as long as we get some killer action in animation, I'm sure a lot of this can be smoothed over because as lead writer, whatever the fuck that means for this project, Junichi Sakai says, <laughs> は、もう世界的にもレベルが高くて、そういう非常に評価が高いものにはなってると思うんですけれども。So production starts somewhere between 96 early 97 with a release date of March 1999. While they have the story somewhat figured out, work then begins on turning Shiro's art and characters into working animation worthy models. And by God and all that is holy, they can't do it. <laughs> I've been trying to do a lot more deep dives into behind the scenes documentaries about anime whenever I can find them, and I have noticed a clear trend when it comes to on screen interviews. 
You see, the Japanese have a sort of linguistic dance when it comes to frank matters, especially when they're being on the record. In general, it's just not seen as polite to be forthright and upfront, so when you're being asked direct questions, you're kind of challenged for an answer, especially if you're feeling none too charitable. So to get around this, Japanese society, by and large, do something that we would call reading between the lines, and what they call, literally translated, reading air. Basically, it's learning to say something without actually saying it. So that way you could, for instance, shit on your former place of work for creatively stymieing you without actually saying it. Now, Grandpa Miyazaki aside, I haven't found too many people in the anime industry willing to air out their grievances, so to speak. And then these assholes came along. They just can't stop talking about how Masamune's art just looks weird and that they aren't designed well and how in the world are they going to make these robots work? Now it's easy to think that they just don't know what the hell they're talking about, but they do. Koji Watanabe is a 30-year veteran of the industry and has been a key animator for Tenchi, Bleach, Digimon Adventure Try, and too many others to count. Likewise, Tetsuro Aoki has been a key animator as well as an animation director for about as long, having worked on My Hero Academia, The Trigun Movie, Samurai 7, and Gundam 0080. These guys know what the hell they're doing, so why do they feel the need to just bitch and bitch about Masamune's art? It's especially galling because at this point, Masamune's landmasters have already been animated. You know, in the Appleseed OVA? That one anime from that one manga that you were so proud of for having lifted for your completely original IP? That one anime that came out eight fucking years before you even began production? This little featurette here comes with the DVD and it would be infuriating if it wasn't so goddamn funny. Like, imagine if you were an otaku in the 90s and you bought the Gundress manga and you listened to the audio dramas. Yes, this had audio dramas. I wasn't kidding when I said that this was supposed to be a huge deal. And you were getting hyped for the upcoming film. So you plopped down the money to learn how the movie was coming along and you're treated to about 15 minutes of these guys just putting around and complaining about how hard it is to animate this, you guys. <laughs> <laughs> At this point, would it surprise anyone to find out that Orca missed deadlines? Like, all of them? Now, deadlines in anime production are always a stressful time, but here's the thing. When Nikatsu partnered with Toei for a theater release in March 1999, they meant it. There's no, it's done when it's done. It's March 1999. Period. For a combination of reasons of scheduling, committed money, and etc., they had to meet that deadline. You see, Nikatsu, Toei, and Orca weren't the only ones banking on this movie, as a committee was formed to oversee production which involved another entity known as Sanctuary, who by right also had a stake in the film. With so many people to answer to, the deadline had to stay. So you're thinking that maybe they had to tie on their Ichiban headbands and go into hardcore Captain Crunch mode? And they may have, though I can't find any written sources attesting to that. But in the end, it didn't matter. Sad to say, they didn't make it. But that didn't stop them from releasing it in theaters! I'm afraid there's one problem, though. What's that? It's the door leading from the subway to the tunnel. It can only be opened from the inside. Oh, no. Oh, no. This is absolutely awful! Oh no! <laughs> Jesus Christ, look at it! Pretty much every action scene is just a pencil test. There's no way in hell this was going to make the deadline. But hey, at least they finished the scene where Alyssa was naked. Glad to see where their priorities were. I mean, the easy point of comparison to make is the Cats movie, but despite that glorious disaster being what it was... At the very, very least, you could say that an attempt was made to make them look like cats. The movie wasn't released with Judy Dench and Jason Derulo still in their mocap suits. 
oh wait, they couldn't have because they didn't use mocap suits. But still, the point remains that there was an attempt. This, on the other hand, is the equivalent of you handing in your midterm that you wrote in pencil on the way to class. I mean, releasing this broken, visually inept clusterfuck of a product, who the hell did they think they were? Bethesda? <laughs> Now, I haven't been able to find physical proof of this, but apparently during the initial theater run for the film, little flyers were handed out that allegedly stated that the film was not done at all and they can't refund your ticket. But if you fill out your name and address, they'll send you the movie on VHS when it's done. No word yet if those VHS tapes came in a nylon bag. But we do know that 7,000 some odd tapes would be sent out four months after that disaster of a theater run. Doing some quick, speculative math here, let's try to be charitable and say that only 10% of those that bought a ticket wanted the VHS tape, which would push up the paying audience count to an optimistic total of 70,000. Now again, because of the ubiquity of discounts for seniors and students, as well as discounts for time of day and such, let's again assume the best and say that everyone paid full price. While we don't know what the average price of a ticket to a movie in Japan was during that time, we do know that the average rate hadn't changed much before 2019 where theater chains tacked on an extra 100 yen. For nearest makes no difference 26 years, which does include 1999. So if that's true, we can assume that going to the movies must have been a luxury experience because a ticket would have cost about 1800 yen or $17.19 American in 1999. So $17.19 times 70,000 is not even close to 5 million. The numbers don't lie and they spell disaster for you. But the damage wasn't over yet. Remember me telling you that there was a committee that oversaw production? Well, they weren't too happy that they were on the hook for not only this incomplete film that was never going to make their money back, but also be on the hook for shipping thousands of VHS tapes. Sanctuary wound up suing Nikatsu for damages, though I can't find any court documents about how that little spat resolved itself. Needless to say, Gundress wound up being a black eye for nearly everyone involved. Though anime films had missed deadlines before, and some have had facelifts of sorts after their initial theater or broadcast run, no other anime film has had such a high-profile, miserable, and embarrassing run as Gundress. Though many on its creative side would go on to have respectable careers, not everyone was so lucky. To my knowledge, Junichi Sakai never wrote again, only credited for special thanks here and there. There were also other men involved in the writing and creation of the film, but they too disappeared from the anime scene after Gundress. As for the director, well, you're not gonna believe this, but he did go on to direct episodes of the Dirty Pair OVA, Gundam Seed, as well as Boku no Pico. And I assure you, that will be the last time that show will ever be mentioned on Anime Abandon. As for Nikatsu, well, if they learned anything, it's that they needed to be more selective with what they put their money behind. They would be bought from Namco in 2005 by a Japanese holding company that would go on to become Ixit Corporation, which also used to own Atlas and Studio Madhouse. Nikatsu then pivoted toward focusing on anime-inspired live-action films, and helped produce not only the Death Note movies, but also the Gantz movies. They also lent production help with the Rebuild movies, them having built their relationship up with Madhouse by helping with the end of Evangelion. But that still leaves a part of this story untold. Who in the world would ever try to pick up an anime with the kind of baggage that Gundress has for an American audience? I'm a jackass! <laughs> Sorry. Kicked up a bit of dust using that reference. The uppers, Media Blasters would announce in 2002 that they would release Gundress under their Anime Works label, and even had the sheer balls to say that there would be a limited theatrical run. An American theater run for Gundress. I never meant to get you involved. I thought I'd made it clear I didn't want to see you again. Even though you're my brother, I could never condone how you make your living dealing illegal arms. In 2002, how could you know when they're gonna get here? When you walk with God Allah, you learn to listen when he speaks. Yeah, not happening. 
Much to our collective dismay, Media Blasters never included the infamous unfinished cut of the film on their DVD release, like the original Japanese DVD did. And despite trying to hype the release of it, it was pretty clear from day one that they didn't actually invest much time into localizing it, rather than follow what Orca did and pip the hell out of it with Masamune's name. The transfer was made from a film reel, which wasn't properly formatted to fit a 4x3 aspect ratio, and also includes many a cigarette burn for projectionists. All of this despite the movie being only three years old by this point in time, so a master tape should have been readily available. Further, the dub suffers from shoddy translation work, the most egregious being the mispronunciation of the main antagonist's name. What have you got? It's a data file on the terrorist group. Jan Ruck was the leader. Guys, you do know it's supposed to be Jean-Luc, right? As in Captain Picard? How the anime spells his freaking name for you! It boggles the mind how one film has had so much incompetence swirling around it, only for it to be mostly forgotten in the annals of anime history. Shot out by Anime Works less than five months after its 2002 announcement, then having a brief blip of resurgence on the Stars Action Channel in 2006, never really to be heard from again afterward. As for the anime itself, well, all I really have to say is, did you guys see Bubblegum Crisis? You did? Good, then you've seen Gudress. It's ostensibly the exact same plot of a woman gathering a bunch of other disparate women to fight using mech suits to save a fictional futuristic city. Hell, their names are just different enough to avoid a lawsuit. Right, Sylvia? The only real difference is that they're not fighting a bunch of androids, just a bunch of cybernetically enhanced terrorists led by Jean-Luc. For reasons that go completely unexplained, Alyssa and Jean-Luc used to be an item together before they were separated, and Alyssa was recruited into Sylvia's anti-terrorist outfit, Angel Arms. Yes, a former terrorist is recruited into an anti-terrorist group, and then given a bitching mech suit to pilot. Was it that obvious that this script was written on the fly? Truth be told, the movie is actually pretty boring and trite. The only real memorable parts of the film is the ending, where it basically turns into Lawnmower Man and Alyssa has to chase John Luke into the virtual world where he literally noms on government secrets. I never cared if Hassan lived or died. These secrets are worth a fortune. Any country would be willing to pay me whatever I ask for them. <laughs> is it any wonder that I decided to talk about the making of Gundress rather than Gundress itself? Likewise, is it any wonder that Gundress would go on to be mostly forgotten here in the States, which is a real shame, not because it's any good, mind you, but because it should serve as a reminder of what it truly takes to make an anime. And make it on time. As for now, though, we are approaching the last leg of our Anime Works journey, and what we have in store for us seems to be yet another dime-a-dozen action OVA. Can't imagine why this is...